welcome to Tomorrow Science. I'm your host, Jade Kim, and I have next to me, Anathena. Today, we are gonna be sitting down with Dr. Walter Longo of the USC Longevity Institute, and we are gonna talk all about how you can literally regenerate your body through the power of diet and fasting mimicking. Stay tuned, there's a lot to be learned. Anathena, what else do we have? We're then gonna look at your comments and questions from last month's show. This is Tomorrow Science Discovery 1.11. And hello again, welcome to Tomorrow Science. We are gonna go ahead and dive right into the interview. Um, so Dr. Walter Longo, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, and really quick, would you mind introducing yourself to our viewers? Yes, uh, I'm Professor Longo. I'm a professor of gerontology and biological sciences at USC. I'm also, I direct a lab in Milan on uh, oncology and longevity. Wonderful, how exciting. And also, I wanted to say really quickie, quickly, congrats on being named to Time, uh, Mag Time Magazine's Healthcare 50, which is um, basically they named the 50 most influential people in healthcare. And Dr. Longo was actually um, on that list for 2018. So a huge congratulations to you. Well, thanks, thanks. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so getting right into it, um, what first interested you in the fields of nutrition and longevity and basically what led you down this path of all these amazing, um, all this amazing research that you do? Um, I always, uh, for some reason, I was always interested in aging and, um, and nutrition really started uh, with the Walford lab at UCLA back in the early 90s. Uh, Walford, the Roy Walford was one of the pioneers uh, on uh, longevity and nutrition. And um, it was doing something called calorie restriction. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, that was uh, uh, something that I was very interested in. But eventually I turned back to uh, simple systems and genetics of aging to then return to the nutrition uh, maybe a decade later in the early 2000s. Um, and, and really our focus has been on connecting nutrients with genes and genes with aging that's uh, that's really what uh, we've always focused on wow so how did that lead into then creating the longevity diet and and how does that tie in with fasting i really want to talk about that yeah so the, the i think uh, i learned a lot from walford and walford uh, this uh, calorie restriction was essentially something very simple. What happens if you just eat about 30% less? Mm -hmm. and, 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 the, uh, and the results were extraordinary, but they were also problematic, meaning that there was lots of benefits and, and diseases, but uh, then the person would be made to uh, look anorexic, and, and that uh, caused lots of problems. Uh, and so what we did in the next, let's say, 20 years was to... Uh, how can we get these extraordinary benefits with, of calorie restriction without the problems of calorie restriction? And uh, uh, I think now we, uh, we succeeded in the longevity diet. Uh, the book was really about putting, to, putting these 25 years of, of work that I've done, and, uh, but not just my work, but really the work of, of many people that I personally collaborated with and, uh, um, and put it in the book in a way that uh, people can start utilizing it, certainly I used them myself for, for decades, and, and I just felt that it was time that everybody else at least had an opportunity to read it and decide whether that's something that they want to also do. That's really great. Um, and I have a question, though. So um, I'm assuming, did you do most of your research in America? Because obviously, America is kind of well known for our obesity epidemic. Um, so did you... Basically, two questions. Did you mainly study folks in America? And then second question, did you do anything in comparison, for instance, from where you're from, Italy, where it's a lot healthier over there? In terms of statistically, it's a lot healthier over there, and people are a lot... There's not a not as much obesity over there as there is over here. Yeah, uh, yeah so uh, all of our... All of my studies uh, originally were in the United States. I mean, the U.S. has been really... 
leader in the longevity field. Uh, it took everybody else much, much longer to figure out how important this field was. Um, but, uh, you know, then uh, we, we've done lots of uh, studies, particularly in the last 10 years, also in Europe, um, in uh, not just Italy, but also Holland, Germany, and elsewhere. And, um, uh, yeah, obesity used to be a United States problem. It's no longer a United States problem. In fact, uh, uh, if you look at Italy, some regions of the south of Italy have as much of a problem as the U.S., Oh, wow. And if you look at uh, uh, infant obesity and, and child obesity, uh, it's very similar, actually, between Italy and the United States. Uh, uh, so, yeah, those, those uh, days where it was just the U.S. are over. Now you have lots of countries that have similar problems, whether it's Mexico, some countries of the Middle East, uh, Southern Europe, et cetera. And pretty soon it's going to be, um, you know, health of the world. And, uh, yeah, so there's... Uh, the, the bad habits uh, that, that we've seen here for a while are, are now uh, a, uh, a, a big uh, worldwide problem with about 20% uh, of the world population now having some form of uh, metabolic syndrome. Wow. So f for the studies that you did do, what were the steps specifically that you took for implementing the longevity diet on, on each of these people? Um, I want to really know like, what it takes to actually do this diet. Um, well, I mean, I, I'm not sure if you're asking about the, the steps to get to the diet or the steps to do the diet. But, uh, you know, to get to the diet, uh, obviously, it's decades of work and the genetics of aging were really important. You know, the identification mm -hmm. of, of genes like TOR, SS kinase, and a PKA uh, made by my lab, but uh, also mm -hmm. learning from the discoveries of others like Cynthia Canyon. Uh, in, in Northern California and others. Uh, yeah, so th that, that, that was really the beginning uh, and, uh, and really uh, also was about the focus on aging and not on disease. Uh, so the idea was treat aging, and if you treat aging and you implement healthy longevity, then the diseases are going to follow, mm. and you're going to be able to uh, first prevent diseases and then eventually even treat diseases better. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, you know, of course, the implementation on, on people uh, is um, it, it, it required its own uh, uh, science, meaning that we had to spend lots of time first with mice and then eventually with people to see uh, what can we, uh, particularly with this fasting mimicking diet uh, that I assume we're going to talk about later, but uh, uh, you know, Health of the Longevity Diet book is about this fasting making diet. And fasting making diet is something that uh, lasts about five days. It's a low calorie, low protein, low sugar, high fat diet. Mm -hmm. And um, and it was developed to, uh, first of all, be safe uh, for people, but also be as effective as water only fasting. And, um, and, uh, um, uh, and also be something that is doable, meaning that we didn't want to come up with another diet that uh, people will do for a couple of months uh, and then and then uh, um, not continue mm -hmm. uh, it was important to do something that people could actually stick with uh, uh, for a long time uh, and so yeah that's where the, the fasting making diet comes from absolutely so then let's go ahead and get right into it um, you do promote the fasting mimicking so my question is what's the difference between just your traditional fasting and your fasting mimicking if you can go ahead and explain that for us well, traditional fasting uh, is, uh, I always say it's a word that doesn't mean anything. It's like saying traditional eating. Um, it, it just, there's a million different versions. And what happened in the past uh, uh, is that um, fa fasting came around every 50 years or so, and then it disappeared because eventually somebody gets hurt uh, and doctors will, will go against it. And, and, and this whole um, field uh, uh, goes away. So what we try to do is uh, to uh, figure out, uh, like for eating, what is it uh, about fasting that is helpful and it doesn't have any side effects? Um, and that's where the fasting mean diet uh, uh, comes from. Uh, it, it is about uh, uh, content and so nutrients and the understanding of what I call nutrient technology. So what is the connection, let's say, between amino acids contained in proteins and uh, TOR signaling, IGF-1 signaling, so these genes that I referred to earlier, uh, 
uh, or sugars and PKA. So that was uh, what we worked on, and that's where the fasting making diet comes from. Mm. Uh, lots of understanding of these connections, but also understanding of, for example, what makes somebody full or what, makes so what protects someone from passing out uh, because maybe the salts in the diet are too low or, or what could exacerbate somebody that may already be vitamin B12 deficient. And then you, uh, let's say you put this person on a five day or 10 day water only fasting and you bring them over the edge, right? So these are all things that uh, we uh, had to address to, uh, to begin to now uh, move this into mainstream medicine I mean, it's not quite there yet, but it's certainly, uh, it's certainly moving in that direction. And so now, for example, fasting, some type of fasting is the, is the most used uh, dietary intervention for people under the age of 34. Uh, just to tell you how uh, popular now is getting in the U.S. and worldwide. But uh, I think for this to, to stay around, uh, we need to uh, standardize it. And we need to really uh, focus on the standard way that uh, medicine has worked all these uh, uh, you know, centuries uh, and not try to improvise uh, because improvisation uh, is going to lead to another failure. Exactly. Right. Um, so you mentioned a lot about the aging process and particularly how that intertwines with um, DNA. But we actually have a question in our chat room um, that asks, we hear a lot about the aging process, but what is actually happening at a basic level? What problem does our DNA have? And then I'm going to connect it back to you by saying, what problem does our DNA have? And then how specifically does the fasting mimicking diet um, aim to alleviate or to perhaps, uh, yeah, to basically help those issues? Yeah, our DNA doesn't have any problems. Um, you know, our DNA is uh, the result of billions of years of, of evolution. Um, and it's, it's fine. Uh, now, some people's DNA is worse than other people's DNA, meaning that you could have mutation, for example, BRCA1 mutation that Angelina Jolie has. Uh, these are the type of mutation that can, uh, that can give you uh, cancer, basically, or they make it much, much more likely than everybody else to get breast cancer. So some people have that problem. Now, if the question is about what problem does the DNA um, uh, accumulate, that's a different question, meaning that, uh, of course, during aging, uh, everything in the human body gets somewhat damaged. And uh, the DNA uh, is one of the uh, DNA uh, is one of the molecules that are uh, damaged by this, this process. And eventually, this uh, DNA damage can affect the cellular function and the function of the organism. Uh, so the fasting mimicking diet, the job of the fasting mimicking diet is really about allowing the body to fix itself. Mm -hmm. and, and, and so I always say, if you cut yourself, uh, the, the body is very much able to fix this problem. And a couple of weeks later, you don't really see any uh, of the original wound, right? And, and I always thought, is it really likely that after 3 billion years of evolution, mm -hmm. we do not have a way to repair the inside of the body? We just have a, a very sophisticated way to repair the outside, but not the inside. Uh, so the fasting making diet, we believe, and lots of our evidence, is that it is probably the most powerful way to do this self-repair. So uh, activate the ability of the body to get rid of damaged DNA, get rid of damaged protein, get rid of even of damaged cells and replace these damaged cells with function, new ones, functional ones, uh, in part or in large part by activating stem cells, but not just, uh, but not just by a stem cell-based mechanism. Wow. What is the most important age um, that you would have to say for someone to start doing this type of uh, controlled mimicking fasting in order to have maximum benefits throughout their life? Yeah, I can tell you we've, had, we've been having meetings uh, uh, just to take it to the extreme. I just had another meeting yesterday with uh, people uh, from the, uh, U, uh, U, uh, not USC, but uh, Los Angeles Children's Hospital. And the discussions are about uh, uh, type 1 diabetes, but mm -hmm. also type 2 diabetes and obesity. Mm -hmm. uh, can we intervene in children um, uh, that are maybe uh, very young 
uh, a, with these fasting mimicking diets um, to uh, control obesity and, and reverse the course, right? So there's a study that came out recently showing that if children uh, are overweight between the age 7 and 13, I think they had about a 40% increased chance of developing diabetes lifetime. And if they were overweight between the age 7 and 18, they had a fourfold increase in uh, uh, diabetes, uh, diabetes uh, risk uh, lifetime. And so, um, you know, we are now uh, considering doing clinical trials with uh, several children's hospitals, both in, in Europe and the United States, um, to use the fasting making diet. Uh, but of course, you know, our focus uh, is on adults. Mm -hmm. And um, and so um, we think that uh, probably somebody even 25 years old uh, uh, could do the fasting making diet a couple times a year. Uh, and um, and then uh, really the fasting making diet should be based on the need, meaning that um, if somebody's obese and they have a high cholesterol, high blood pressure, high mm -hmm. Uh, fasting glucose level, mm -hmm. they might have to do this uh, once a month uh, mm -hmm. under uh, some type of medical supervision. And uh, but if somebody is a 30 year old athlete and they're mm -hmm. perfectly healthy, they have a pescatarian uh, ideal uh, longevity everyday diet. Uh, again, um, maybe a couple times a year is uh, sufficient. Perfect. And that actually was going to lead into um, my follow-up question was, how do you accommodate the fasting mimicking diet for those who are quite active and do need kind of a more uh, more of a caloric need than, say, your average sedentary person? Yeah, so the, the big difference, I think, about what, we, uh, what we're doing and what everybody else is doing is that we're telling people uh, you don't really need to change anything, meaning that uh, half of the book tells you what the ideal lifestyle is, right? But mm -hmm. the other half of the book says, I understand that some people are not going to change anything. Mm -hmm. And so if you're an athlete, you're going to keep doing what it is that you always done. But so many times a year, you have to take a break. And for those five days, uh, do the fasting making diet and really uh, take it easy, right? So, mm -hmm. so, there is, so if you're an athlete and you're very active and you're burning 3,000 calories a day, and you have a diet that you don't want to change, that's fine. But let's say three times a year, now you you do this prolonged uh, fasting mimicking diet. Uh, don't exercise during those five days. There is no need to exercise all the time. This is, a, in fact, a great time to allow the body to fix itself, to mm -hmm. repair itself. You know, uh, Give it th those five days, uh, and maybe a couple of days later, after you finish the diet, this regeneration moment, this refeeding moment, uh -huh. uh, is really there to to fix things. And so, you know, for a week around the, the fasting making diet is uh, is good to uh, uh, to just focus on that. I mean, on that and whatever uh, job that you do, there is no reason to stop doing what you normally do. But there is a reason to stop, uh, let's say, exercising. In fact. Uh, you're likely to pass out or to have uh, big problems if you uh, mm -hmm. exercise during uh, a fasting mim mimicking diet period. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And it's interesting you mentioned that too. For instance, I know particularly in the realm of like weight training, um, a lot of people report that when they do take a week off or when they do what's called like a deload, um, which does involve like heavy calorie restricting and then not exercising, when they come mm -hmm. back, they often find that their strength increased. Um, and I, I would imagine it would have to do with the fact that your body's regenerating and repairing itself. Would that be, does that sound accurate? Yes, absolutely. So we now know this for mice. Uh, we're doing a clinical trial in Verona, University of Verona, on this, on the strength. Uh, soon enough, we'll have results and, uh, and uh, we'll maybe able, be able to have a, a formal answer uh, to your question. Interesting. Well, speaking of actually regenerating the body, there's a really good question in the chat from Johnny Spacer. And he asks, could a person's skin cells or fat cells be extracted, made into stem cells, and inject into the body to do similar work that fasting does? What do you think about that? Yeah, yeah. This is, I always, uh, uh, this is biohacking, right? So <laughs> mm -hmm. I mean, people always want to go to biohacking, you know, try to outsmart three billion years of evolution. And I always say, sure, I mean, we are also doing biohacking. The fast thing we making that is a, a biohacking system, but it's a respectful one, right? So it's a biohacking mm -hmm. system that works with evolution, works with tradition and history. 
to make sure that we don't interfere uh, with the normal process of, of repair and regeneration. Why is that? Because you know, imagine three billion years, I, I call it three billion years of research and development, right? So it's, it's a long time, right? Yeah. And now let's say you take cells from fat and you try to uh, make it into stem cells and then repair a tissue. You can do that. I mean, this is actually done for, for joints. Uh, there is a, many clinics that are now doing this. Uh, and in some cases, it can be effective, right? You can solve some limited problems. Uh, let's say you have some uh, degeneration in, in some uh, uh, cartilage or, or, or some area, uh, specific areas. These stem cells taken from the fat cells, uh, they can be effective. You know, I, I, I'm not uh, familiar with all the studies in this uh, field, but I, I know that they can be successful. Um, but when you're looking at the entire body and let's say, you know, a, a, a system that includes the, the nervous system, the brain, uh, includes the, uh, the heart, the liver, et cetera. So there is many very sophisticated, complex systems. Now, if you take stem cells and you inject them and you try to biohack your way through it, uh, you, you're probably going to do more damage than good in the overall system, right? And again, it could work for certain uh, specific purposes, but we're nowhere near trying to beat this, those three billion years of evolution. So now we have to sort of work with that and say, let's respect this, this uh, incredible sophistication. Let's say, think about, a, uh, if you go back to the wound, think about cutting yourself. And somebody says, well, uh, can, can we have some stem cells that can, can, you can just inject and so you can repair this uh, more quickly? Well, yeah, everything is possible, but you certainly want, don't want to interfere with this natural process that it's going to mm -hmm. almost perfectly repair your wound, right? Mm -hmm. uh, eventually, yes, we'll, we'll, we'll be better than that. But, uh, but again, that's probably like 50 years away. Huh. Interesting. Wow. Um, so there actually is a, a question here in the chat that Zapfan Zapfan asks. Um, let me highlight that. He says, um, uh, have you done any randomized clinical trials of this? Because uh, I really think that that might be a, an accurate way to sort of express what's happening with this. Yeah. So we've done uh, multiple randomized clinical trials. We mm. have uh, several on cancer. Mm. Uh, last year, we published one on 100 uh, subjects. Uh, and the fast mimicking diet called Prolon mm -hmm. and showed uh, uh, lots of uh, very uh, potent results. Uh, for example, lowering the cholesterol, blood pressure, triglycerides, mm -hmm. uh, fasting glucose, uh, uh, systemic inflammation, uh, markers or risk factors for, for cancer, et cetera. So it works very well. Um, now we're collecting data from about two or 3,000 patients uh, and, and hundreds of doctors uh, to also look at the safety uh, how safe is this? But uh, this has been done by, uh, I think, uh, um, you know, tens of thousands of people. And, and thus far, uh, there have been no safety concerns. And, uh, and again, the clinical trials seem to, uh, to show efficacy. We also have a clinical trial uh, that in collaboration with Charité Hospital uh, that uh, looked at multiple sclerosis patients. And, uh, and that also uh, showed positive results. Uh, yeah, so... And uh, uh, the first three or four trials that were published are all positive. Um, now we're doing larger trials with three, four, five hundred patients. And those are going to be uh, very important to, uh, uh, to have conclusive uh, 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 data, particularly on the disease uh, state, meaning that yeah. it's pretty clear now it's safe for, for uh, people that are, uh, that, are, that are not sick um, and, uh, and also it's pretty clear that it can be effective and, um, but, uh, yeah, somebody has diabetes or cancer or autoimmunities, uh, for those, we still have to do the large trials to mm -hmm. figure out uh, if it works and, uh, and also, um, does it work in combination with specific therapies? In many cases, we will be combining, let's say, uh, fasting and immunotherapy mm -hmm. or, or fasting and, uh, and some of the standard of care for uh, autoimmunities. That's fantastic. And I remember when I was kind of doing a little bit of research on um, on your research, I did come across a few articles about combining the method with those who are undergoing, you know, chemotherapy or undergoing some sort of treatment that already takes a huge toll on the body. Mm -hmm. But um, some of those issues are 
kind of alleviated through that. So that that's really awesome because it's great to have the average person get healthier, but when you can help somebody who's already going through something absolutely detrimental to their bodies mm -hmm. and make it a little bit easier on them, you know, it's kudos to you, basically. <laughs> um, and that kind of leads me into my next question. Um, can you talk to us about what the Walter Longo Foundation is and kind of what it does? Yeah, actually, in the U.S. is uh, called Create Cures Foundation. Okay. Uh, in Italy, is Walter Longo Foundation. <laughs> uh, but uh, uh, yeah, well, I, I mean, I bought, as I say in the book, I was always be I was always surprised that um, when patients came to me and they come uh, still every day and they have you know usually advanced uh, diseases, uh, that there is not a system. Uh, to take care of them. So they let's say you have cancer, you go to the oncologist, and then, you know, uh, as the oncologist tell me, they have lots of questions about, for example, nutrition, what mm -hmm. should they eat? And, um, and so there is really not a system, uh, A, to advise them on that, but more so there is not a system that involves, uh, I, I, say, I say in the book that I believe that molecular biologists can have a, a, a major central place in medicine. What I mean by that, I mean that if you have an advanced disorder, somebody that has in-depth understanding of the molecular biology of that disorder, let's say cancer, can help the oncologist in working in a team, can help the oncologist uh, strategize uh, much more effectively against that particular disorder. And the oncologists are usually don't have lots of time. They see lots of patients. So having, let's say, a, a dietitian, but also a molecular oncologist, uh, and this team is so important and, uh, and, and doesn't exist in, in, in the great majority of places. So this is what the foundation, the Create Cures Foundation, is focusing on. Can we uh, start a clinic? Uh, we started one in, in Italy or started a center in Italy, and pretty soon we're going to open one in the U.S. that uh, forms this team and, and can help people with, that have big problems uh, trying to identify the best solution. And that's one thing. Then, of course, education. We're starting to go into the schools and educate children on eating healthy for life, not just eating uh, healthy to grow, but uh, what is, the, as I mentioned earlier, your uh, chances of developing diabetes could be already set by the time you turn to 18 to be four times higher than everybody else's. Just mistakes made before the age of 18, right? So. So that's another thing that the foundation is doing, educating in schools. And, uh, uh, and then, of course, funding research, uh, uh, funding research at USC and, 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 and the EFOM Oncology Center in Italy, but uh, funding many uh, clinical trials or parts of clinical trials. So that's, uh, the, those are the, the, some of the major efforts uh, of the foundation. Wow. I have a pretty... Um... I guess sort of personal question with this because I feel like it's obvious why this is important, right? It's not just about this uh, interest of wanting to live longer, but also wanting to be healthy, wanting to try and fight against diseases. But I really want to know, like, what made you first interested in wanting to do something like this and try to really cause a shift for humanity and the way that we look at what we put into our body and how we can improve our health? Yeah, I mean, I'm not sure, but you know, I was 19 years old. That uh, I was at University of North Texas. I was a jazz ma a jazz uh, performance major, oh, wow. a guitar player. Oh, nice! And, and as you can see, I still have the sort of like the the, the guitar player look. <laughs> um, but, um, you know, I just thought uh, I was interest, extremely interested in music, and I didn't think I was going to be able to do anything else. But I kept thinking about aging and 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 the. Also, the role, I was thinking, why doesn't everybody talk about aging mm -hmm. in addition to medicine, right? So why, why all people that get sick are older, so why don't we, I mean, of course, it was a very naive uh, uh, question at the time, but, but uh, certainly uh, I just felt that this aging and, and medicine field uh, was such an incredible opportunity that I didn't even see the competition uh, with the music, uh, uh, and and so uh, yeah, since the age 19, I, I was uh, I was uh, pretty sure that that's all I want to do, and uh, you know that's all I, I've ever done. And then I think you know my my grandfather, um, I I saw him dying when I was six, five or six years old, mm. and I I mean at the time I didn't uh, think anything of it, but 
I guess is the, the seeing somebody dying at the age five or, or whatever. Um, I, I'm imagining that stuck in my head and I, I always saw life as very uncertain, you know, maybe that's why when I was 19, just like, you know, 13 years later, uh, maybe that was so powerful in my head that everything else didn't seem, you know, when, it, when you see somebody die like that, uh, everything else seems like not that important, right? You sort of realize that you can make music very important, but if you're unhealthy, uh, if you're sick, uh, then, uh, then you're not going to be able to do that. And, uh, and so that's, uh, that's maybe what, uh, I mean, I don't know, but that I always, uh, assume that, uh, that really uh, shaped this interest in my head, uh, uh, starting at a very young age. Nice. Wow. That's that. Thank you for sharing that with us. That really does yeah. kind of put the human aspect to it. Um, and so you mentioned that you, you started this, you know, fascination with medicine and longevity and just how people live their lives. Um, so in the early stages of your research, were you ever at any point um, not discouraged, but maybe a little frustrated with the sheer amount of pseudoscience that exists in the realm of diets and fads and so-called like nutritional guidance? Uh, yeah. So, well, first of all, of course, uh, uh, as a scientist, uh, if you want to try to change the way things are done, you're going to get to many points where you're thinking of quitting. Uh, <laughs> you always get to points where you realize that uh, nobody really cares about the, the research you're doing. Um, and so that's certainly one, uh, one experience that you have to go through to change things, you know, because if you do what everybody else does, uh, if you're looking for uh, people to say you're right, then you have to follow what everybody else does and you really don't discover anything that is that new. Um, and then, uh, so, so there is that phase. Uh, but then, of course, the second phase is the, the, the fat diets that you, you're describing. And, uh, you know, that's still a problem, uh, no matter what, no matter what recognition you get and, and how much, uh, you know, Time Magazine talks about uh, you, um, you still have to fight a lot, a lot of uh, ideas out there. Um, but I, I, I really was impressed when I saw the survey this year, the, the official survey that came out, I forgot of what institute. And, um, and there were several things in there that really surprised me. You know, for example, fasting being the number one diet now used by people, but also something else, it was uh, the uh, protein people were asked, well, what do you think about proteins? And people answered, and this is just a thousand Americans picked from anywhere. And they answer, uh, if high protein is bad for you, or uh, I forget what, I think it was high protein is bad for you, but if they're from plant-based sources, then it's okay, right? So <laughs> I was very impressed with uh, how people understood much more than we give them credit for. So even though there is all this noise and all these this, this, uh, bad ideas out there, um, that people were listening, they were paying attention to lots of the things that we were doing and not just we, mm -hmm. uh, and the others were doing. And so um, I, uh, this is why I wrote the book. And in the book, I talk about five pillars. And I say, you know, we come up with uh, high protein, low protein. It's not just an opinion. We look at the mouse data. Then we look at the clinical trials. Then we look at the epidemiological uh, trials then uh, our studies, then we look at centenarians, and then we look at complex system. How does a car, a plane, the space shuttle, right? I talk about mm -hmm. the space shuttle a lot in my book. And uh, so, yeah, so that's a, this is an approach that I think, you know, uh, the, lots of people from all over the world that read the book appreciate it. It wasn't just, oh, um, let me tell you, I, I'm the expert, I'm tell you what to do. It was, more, it was more like, let me show you how I built this uh, uh, conclusion. And uh, it starts from the very bottom. It starts with evolution, bacteria, yeast that are starving. And then I build it up all the way to mice. And then from mice to the genetics of, of aging humans. You know, we follow these people in Ecuador that almost never get diseases, right? And the mice, they have the same mutation, have the same phenotype. Mm -hmm. This was really important in, in building it. And then uh, people, I think, once they heard the whole story, then they uh, I think they appreciate it and they paid attention. And that survey, I think, uh, uh, is some evidence that they're paying much more attention than we give people credit for. 
Absolutely. And you know what? I think especially um, that aligns with our philosophy as a science channel ourselves. Um, when you mentioned that we often don't give the general public a whole lot of credit when it comes to um, all of the noise out there, but you know, them being able to discern what is good versus not good science. So, um, yeah. yeah, definitely a great sentiment worth echoing. Um, so to conclude this interview, um, where can our viewers go to find out more about the longevity diet, fasting mimicking, and to potentially change their lives? <laughs> Yeah, so the um, so WalterLongo.com is the the site where we now have the uh, English version, Italian version, lots of languages, pretty soon, and that's where the foundations uh, operate. And now we might have a different website for the foundation, but we're trying to figure it out. And then um, uh, the uh, Facebook uh, Professor Walter Longo Facebook page. That's where we post lots of. Uh, I have several uh, nutritionists and dietitians. Uh, and, uh, and they go through the literature. We look for studies like the one I mentioned earlier about diabetes in children. Mm -hmm. So we, we read it, uh, and we screen, then we read it, and then if we decide that this is a good article, we uh, post it and then also find uh, lay person articles, let's say, you know, the New York Times or, or, or uh, maybe an article online that is does a good job at explaining what the study showed and then we post it so yeah professor walter longo uh, facebook page is a good way to follow us and if you just like the page then you know you're going to get all the, the new articles that we post and any uh any announcements for example uh i'm, I'm not sure when you're going to show this but november 9 and 10 in, in uh, november 9th in los angeles i'm organizing a conference on um, fasting, and we're going to have a public series of lectures uh, where we're going to have the, all the world uh, or many of the world experts on, on fasting uh, presenting. And so this is going to be at the Radisson uh, at USC, near USC on November 9th, uh, uh, starting at 4.30 p.m. Um, yes. Yeah, so. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much for spending the time talking with us today. It was just utterly fascinating. Yeah, and I thank you. Yeah, I can't wait for the follow-up comments on this segment. Yeah. Um, so we are actually going to take a really Let quick... Let me say one more thing. I forgot the yeah, Prolon, yeah. Uh, the, the fasting making diet, uh, I think is ProlonFMD.com. And people can uh, can go there. Uh, and, uh, and then uh, there is a network of doctors and, and nutritionists that can be assigned to the person. Uh, if they need uh, this assignment. Perfect. And I'm sure we'll have all the links listed, all the correct links listed right there in the bio, or not the bio, but the description underneath. Mm -hmm. um, so again, if you're you. interested in any of the above or any of the uh, aforementioned, please definitely click and learn more. Um, so we are going to go ahead and head on to a quick commercial break. But before we do that, we are going to go ahead and give a large thank you to our Escape Velocity citizens. Yes, these are folks that help make the show happen. They contribute $10 an episode on Patreon as well as our orbital citizens. These lovely people uh, contribute $5 an episode on Patreon. They are literally the lifeblood of the show. Um, and just as much as Dr. Longo promotes longevity in humans, the citizens promote longevity in tomorrow. So if you would like to become part of our immortality, go ahead and head on over to patreon.com slash TMRO. And we will see you in just a few seconds. So don't go anywhere. <sighs> We've always looked to the stars. They guide us, give us comfort, help us find our way. We see ourselves out there. When we look up, it inspires us. and we long for something we don't yet know. We yearn to go there. So, we venture forth. We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other thing, not because they are easy, but because they are hard. Because that goal will serve to organize and measure the best. Tranquility Base here. The Eagle has landed. That's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind.
the exploration of space will go ahead, whether we join in it or not. Many think we stopped exploring. But we know our journey didn't end. We've only just begun. Orion is functioning perfectly at this point. Come with us and explore tomorrow. Thanks for sticking with us. So we're going to go right on into your comments and questions from last week's show. Um, I'm really excited to, to go over this one. Um, so we'll go right on into that uh, first question. Oh, yes. And um, so this is actually from last week's show. This was the Back future. Black. Okay. <laughs> I was like, how much longer right. are you going to look? Like, what was shoot it, shoot it. What was the <laughs> oh, it was. Um, Hello, and thank you for sticking with us. So um, last week's show, we actually spoke with Paul Zaber about uh, what we're learning from a greenhouse out in Antarctica. It's part of the Eden ISS project. Um, it was such a great show, and we got some really good comments that we're going to go right on into right now yeah. and chat about. So um, the first one actually comes right off of YouTube uh, from Helios Works AV, and they say, Having worked with a similar but smaller hydroponics system in the city, it definitely does have a positive psychological benefit in otherwise biologically austere environments. Yeah, so, and I actually I thought yeah. this was a really good point, and um, mm -hmm. I wish we would have brought it up when we spoke with him because, yeah, I didn't even think about that. Like we were talking about obviously mm -hmm. the nutritional benefits of having a yep. fresh salad and garden <laughs> accessible every day, mm -hmm. but psychologically too, because when you're in Antarctica, I, I bet it can get a little monotonous um, just looking at such kind of a icy environment all the time. Mm -hmm. So I imagine the plants do have quite a nice psychological effect. Like, hey, yeah. look, life, how look, nice. It's actually like, yeah, I'm sure that that's, that probably has a huge impact because it's all about you know, trying to be as close to um, nature as possible when you're in such circumstances. Uh, I'm curious if you're actually watching live right now, uh, Helio Works. Where, where is it that you actually work uh, as far as the hydroponic system uh, in the city? I'm really curious um, which one that, that you're part of, because I, I bet that there'd be quite a lot of cool stuff to talk about uh, when it comes to that. So um, the next comment um, also comes off of YouTube from Scott Junner, and they say, uh, bacteria are capable of incredibly fast genetic mutation in order to adapt to changing environments and conditions. So I think it stands for to reason that mutation could result in new bacterial threats. I'm certainly on board with the idea of removing the stigma of poop. It uh, poses risks and we can and do um, mitigate uh, those risks. I've personally eaten uh, food grown uh, in human human -ure. human -ure. and I thought that was so human clever. Um, but yeah, so we we happened to um, mm -hmm. talk about the possibilities of recycling human waste yeah. uh, aboard, mm -hmm. you know, different space missions, including the ISS. Yeah, um, and I was one of the proponents of, hey, why not? you know, remove the stigma of the stinky stuff and really utilize it because there's plenty of it and you're going to have to find out something to do with it. Um, but Scott brings up a really good point, um, and mm -hmm. I personally don't know a whole lot about uh, bacterial mutations or how that can affect humans, but um, definitely something to keep in mind. But what really interested me about this comment is that they've actually eaten food grown in human waste, and so I want them to yeah. tell us, what did you eat? Did it taste different? What were the first bites like psychologically? Like, oh my gosh, yeah. I am literally eating something grown in human poop. Poop. I mean, is yeah. it as bad? But I mean, to be honest though, is it any worse than eating something that was grown in cow poop? In cow poop, yeah, exactly. I mean, exactly. let's be honest, it's, it's all yeah. poop. I mean, anytime too, I used to go out into to the country and out in Texas or um, d different areas that are <laughs> really rural and you would smell cow maneuver, manure. It just was sort of, um, I mean, I was a kid, and even though when you think about it, it's gross, you affiliate it with crops and you affiliate it with harvest. So that's kind of how I always looked at it. So, yeah. I mean, this 
again, psychologically, if it's human poop, it's, I'm sure it's really gross. Uh -huh. But yeah, I wonder too, I wonder what, what would you guys think if you tried that? And actually, <laughs> Johnny Spacer in the chat brings up a really good point. Cow manure is basically a fibrous plant material, aka grass, whereas human waste isn't. And you know what? You could not be more correct, Johnny. Now that I think about especially Western diets and some of the processed things and some of the not as healthy things we put in our bodies, including alcohol and other stuff. Um, yeah. yeah, you know, no, I get it. I get it. Yeah, okay. Yeah, that's I get why it. I always say, too, like, <laughs> you know, I, I mean, mentioning actually alcohol, whenever people are, um, I'm feeling weird about taking shots of wheatgrass or like ginger shots. I usually say, I'm like, well, if you can do a shot of tequila, I'm sure you can do a shot of <laughs> wheatgrass, which is good for you. I mean, maybe that's totally <laughs> Or why context. not use one as a chaser for the other? Uh, I mean, Whichever sure. order is something you prefer personally. Yeah, so I mean, uh, I think with this, it's like valid, valid points. You know, if people are putting other, you know, mysterious things into the body, uh, why not put something that came out of the body too? Anyway. Anyway, so we're gonna, gonna move on now, move this is on. getting weird. This is getting off. <laughs> but anyway, so the uh, next comment, last one comes off of YouTube. I, I like the name, it's Mr. Man. Mr. Man. Mr. Man. Um, and he says, assuming it's a he, uh, missed the opportunity to grow Antarctica's favorite vegetable, the iceberg lettuce. Wow. You went you there. Know, I actually really like iceberg lettuce. That's um, hilarious. That's kind of even funny. though it's the least color. I mean, it's the least nutritionally like dense in of it. the lettuces. But yeah. that's like, cute. Really that was a, a very lot. cute little joke it there. Was a Get nice it? Comment. Iceberg lettuce. Iceberg because they're in Antarctica. Yeah, actually, that's I thought adorable. that was really nice. That's great. And I did learn once about celery. Random fun fact. I learned it from Neil deGrasse Tyson. We were sit sitting and eating peanut butter, and, and he's saying he's like, you know. Celery really is is just there's like no point to it. He's like if you rip out the little strings on there, which is like the fiber, the it pretty much is like negative two calories or something because it has no calories. But when you're chewing, you're burning calories. And I just remember that moment. I was like, okay. Um, but if you guys know how many calories are actually in celery, uh, let us know because I, I'm actually curious now. <laughs> celery is just a fantastic vessel for condiments for like ranch stuffing. and blue yeah. cheese and for helping my mouth after a plate of spicy wings. Yeah. Um, uh, but anyway, yeah. so um, that was a great show. And I'm really excited for the next show. Um, I'm at, we're actually bringing on one of my really good friends. His name is Dr. Kirby Runyon. Um, he's a planetary geologist from John Hopkins University Applied Physics Lab. Guys, OK, I'm really excited for this because um, he's going to be talking about numerous dwarf planets throughout the solar oh. system and how dwarf planets are planets too, unlike wow. what the IAU claims. Um, plus, we talk uh, science results from the New Horizons exploration Dang. of Pluto. So I love the comments that are always going on during the show about Pluto love and dwarf me planets. Love some New so, Horizons. Yes, yes. So definitely, guys, get ready for that. Um, bring everything that you want to say about Pluto and dwarf planets and all that other fun stuff. Oh, it's so gonna much. be Oh, it's good. It's gonna be good. It's gonna be lit. All right. Anyways. Cool. <laughs> On that note, my energy. Is <laughs> all right. So that concludes today's show. Thank you so much for joining us. Before we officially say goodbye, we want to give one more healthy shout out to our Escape Velocity citizens. These generous folks contribute $10 an episode on Patreon. And of course, our Orbital citizens who contribute $5 an episode on Patreon. And you cannot forget our Suborbital citizens, $2.50 per episode on Patreon. I will pause, try to you know let you find your name up there if it is. But you want to know what? It's, it's going to be a lot easier to pick out your name from the next one because look at this, ground support, wow. Just kidding, it'd be a lot harder. It's very small print. <laughs> I love tomorrow because it helps me talk to literally hundreds of what used to be strangers across the world about something I am yeah. insanely passionate about. I get to work with the greatest people on the planet. And to be honest, this was totally the dream gig. And I couldn't yeah. have imagined in a million years that you would say that I could do this every Saturday. Um, that, yeah. that's what it means I get excited every morning every single Saturday morning yeah. literally and I love after the show I go on Twitter and I legit have like all these new like 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 just conversations started from you guys that were like on the show and are just like site referencing things that were said during the show like that actually gets me so excited because then this yeah. conversation like relays over into my uber rides and all this other stuff so it's awesome but yeah so and you make that possible. Yeah. I'm sorry, I'm a terrible <laughs> lip reader. But, yeah. um, but anyways, thank you for staying with us. If you have any questions or comments, please leave them down below. Do not forget to subscribe. Um, hit that little bell that's 
It's down somewhere. here somewhere. You know how to work the YouTube. Um, and we will see you next month, as Athena said. Thanks for sticking around. Have yourselves a great rest of your month. <laughs>